Uh, thank you very much and uh, delighted to be here. I mean, it's going to be really hard for anyone to follow that great presentation from Olaf Corey, which I, I think for me has been a, one of the standouts that we've had uh, so far in this event. But just going back before we start with our speakers to the points that Beatrice Heuser and, and Rob Johnson outlined at the start, this idea of decisiveness being rare, indeed, even if the military are decisive, the outcome doesn't necessarily result in a good or preferable long-term outcome. This is important. Even then, our mindset is about setting the conditions for peace as if there is some kind of end, as if there is some definitive statement that we want to get there that will be stable and in which, like some great beautiful novel, we can close the book and it's all tied up nicely. Yet reality just isn't like that. I mean, we all live in a dangerous, difficult, destructive environment where ends don't really come to a conclusion because life goes on. Things keep evolving. No one turns the page and it's blank and empty and we've come to a conclusion. We don't have an index that just sums up what we've been through. We continue to live. The world continues to evolve. And so if victory is unachievable, as Beatrice and Rob pointed out, then perhaps in many ways it's also undesirable. Either way, there's a requirement for us to live in an indecisive world, an era in which no one party has sole ownership of the end or indeed the journey there. Now, that's quite obviously the situation in which we live. You know, this idea of great power competition, as it's called in a sort of clumsy way to describe the international picture as we see it today. But those relationships between belligerents, they're adversarial, they're competitive, they're transactional. They're interactive and combative. So we will need to learn to live with indecisiveness. And military and politicians might find this difficult. But there is a precedence uh, that we can use uh, rather than just trumping back to the clumsy comparisons with the Cold War and rather transfer them in from elsewhere. We also need to be very careful when we think about this because the way we've expressed indecisiveness so far is in a very Western interpretation of what victory looks like. We need to contrast this with Mao's writings of the Long War, with Sun Tzu's writing, with the Persian ideas of military campaigns, with some interpretations of Mongol fighting doctrine or that of the Russian ideas of time and that of a terrorist mindset, the philosophy of you've got the time, we've got the watch. So we do need to go elsewhere. We need to look outside of warfare to try and understand what it is to live with indecisiveness. And in this panel, we're drawing comparisons with three different facets of life, from health, from policing, and from business, areas of societies and economies where indecisiveness is a way of life, perhaps even by being desirable in some circumstances for economic, moral, or political balance. And it's worth getting into this so we have, to me, a outstanding panel to help us. First off, uh, will be Nita Chowdhury for the American University of Paris. In case you haven't got into a bio, uh, Nita has a career in healthcare. Now, that is a broad title, but in this case, it's absolutely true and well-deserved. She has worked in Canada, Senegal, Uzbekistan, uh, Mexico, India, South Africa, Egypt, Bangladesh and France for organisations from the uh, WHO, UNESCO, UNICEF and the IDRC. She's worked in government, academia and fieldwork. She's covered a much broader array than most healthcare professionals or workers. There are a few better people to give us a perspective from healthcare and she'll be off first. And we'll follow her with uh, Jean-Luc, who is a gendarmerie officer uh, at the operational level of command. He's commanded at every level. He's deployed on operations, as you would expect. He's done the full experience of professional military education. He's written policy and advised on political decisions. His focus has been on constabulary work, including counterterrorism. And he is going to give us a perspective from the sort of philosophy of policing that never ends. There's always enduring levels of crime. And that will be something in terms of a, an idea of indecisiveness from which we can learn. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Sarah Ulrich from PA Consulting, where she's head of war games in the global business. Now, a management consultant academic of 20 years standing. Um, she comes from a background that games volatility, complexity and ambiguity for business. The idea that there is no monopoly 
that businesses need to learn with this idea of indecisiveness in the future and be able to become resilient to it. So without further ado, we've got about 45 minutes, I, I think, left to go. So let's hand over to Nita. And Nita, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm going to just um, start my... Does everyone see my uh, PowerPoint? Do you hear me? Yeah, you're loud and clear and we can see that nicely. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much uh, to have, having me invited me to this very esteemed uh, meeting with really fabulous speakers beforehand. I feel a little out of place as I'm not a, a war um, specialist, but I am a public health specialist and have worked many years on the ground in the field um, in many countries. And what's interesting is that uh, human uh, disease, disability, and death is something that we face on an ongoing uh, process as mortals. And so winning is not something that's decisive because in the end we die. And so it's always staving that death or disability that we're trying to accomplish uh, well-being well-being and living in our lives in society uh, uh, and in families. Um, and so what's interesting is that the, the terms that are used in war, such as battling disease or our war with COVID, which Emmanuel Macron uh, in his first discours uh, mentioned about dealing with this pandemic that we have, that we were at war, was interesting because we, um, we, we think of it as something that we can eradicate and get rid of. But what if in fact we have to live with disease and disability all our lives and, and that in fact, it's not a decisive victory all the time. In fact, the only infectious diseases that we have eradicated to date have been smallpox and rinderpest, which are viruses. All the other diseases have not been eradicated. And interestingly enough, we've been controlling and trying to eliminate them in um, specific geographic areas. Eradication is a big word and requires a lot of coordination. Um, and interestingly enough, there are emerging diseases that will happen that we don't even know will happen, like the zoonotic diseases of COVID, the diseases that are coming and jumping out of the animal kingdom. Um, and with regards to the relationship we have with nature and the encroaching on nature that creates more and more possibility for disease jumping into the human population. So we're always having emerging threats and emerging diseases coming um, and evolving. So how does um, public health deal with the ongoing battle of disease and disability? And I wanted to show you uh, where the burden of disease is. This is an old map because we don't have COVID in here and COVID is an emerging disease. But we can see that most of the burden of disease is in Sub-Saharan Africa, where a number of conflicts are raging um, and are protracted, like Mali, um, and then in other places like Yemen, uh, Niger, other places where the, there's greatest poverty and political instability, as well as where there's the greatest burden of disease. So it's an interesting uh, parallel with uh, where we're trying to deal with unstable instability and where we're dealing with the greatest uh, burden of disease. And uh, interestingly enough, the burden of disease in the world in 2017, the greatest deaths were from cardiovascular diseases um, and things that were related to our modern lifestyle of sedentary, obesity, diabetes, and so on and so forth. Um, and as you can see, uh, malaria and infected tropical diseases still remain among uh, important diseases that are in the world, particularly in the tropical uh, areas of the planet. So when I was asked to talk about um, how does public health and what can we learn from public health about coping with the indecisiveness, I asked, uh, our, um, our, our uh, counterpoints at the war school, what were the key questions they had for me? And these are the questions that they came out with. And this is how I wanted to structure uh, my talk. First of all, how do you envisage the planning process of tackling a public health issue? How do you manage between diverging priorities, the impact on health, 
society, economy, mental health? How do you organize various tools at your disposal, communication versus direct intervention? And when you can't win definitively, how do you define the threshold under which you can live with or despite the issue? So what I want to do was try and answer some of these questions and in some ways as it'll be quite pedantic, but I wanted to have some discussion on some of the tools we use in public health to try and understand problems and tackle issues. Um, and so the first thing that is really important when we're planning in health project planning, and I'm sure when you're doing your strategic planning in, uh, in uh, military exercises, is to really diagnose the situation and have an analysis. And what we look at is really importantly the population and age and sex structure. So we understand the population we're deal dealing with and look at the epidemiology so the distribution of disease in the population. So morbidity, the disease and the mortality, the deaths and understand the geographical distribution of these diseases. So we know on a macro level, what is our population look like? And then we try and understand what are the medical care facilities? What is the quality? What is the quantity? What is the reach? What is the access? What kind of human resources and technical manpower do we have to deal with the problem? What are the training facilities available? And what is really important, what are the attitudes and belief of the population towards diseases in cure and prevention? We need to understand the population. And this is extremely important in understanding the diagnosis of the situation. So when we look at public health, we also need to understand the social context. What is the economic context? What are the cultural behaviors and beliefs that influence uh, health seeking practices? What are some of the behavioral um, aspects that would either increase access to uh, health, uh, health facilities or uh, perhaps uh, dangerous practices uh, that would have an impact on disease and uh, disability? What is the political situation? Who are the key stakeholders? And this is extremely important. When beginning a health project or a public health intervention, key stakeholders must be engaged at the very beginning and they must become partners of a process because an intervention will fail if first the community is a key stakeholder and the other key stakeholders are not part of the intervention. And so when we talk about engaging with stakeholders, and I think this is extremely important when you're working in different communities and different countries to identify very early the diverse number of stakeholders that are out there and how close are they to the problem that you're identifying? How much power do they have to impact change? And then getting stakeholders to talking to one another about the problems and impacts are extremely important. And before even trying to explain yourself as the project implementer or the public health intervention leader, you need to understand before you're understood, understand the context you're in and listen and really listen to what's happening from what the different stakeholders are saying. Lead with integrity and trust. Trust is primordial to have an intervention to be successful. Trust is number one. Work with stakeholders to understand their rules and tasks in addressing the public issue. And this is a dialogue. This is something in which is negotiated and that expectations of the stakeholders need to be developed. And communication is number one when engaging with stakeholders. I think this is important in any kind of intervention that you would undertake uh, in the field. Number two, identifying and prioritizing and analyzing collective health problems are very important. So we talked about the epidemiological diagnosis where key data is important, but often missing in low income and resource settings. So imagine working in Mali or Niger or Yemen or in these settings in which the actual quantifiable data of the population is very low. Um, this kind of data driven, we talk about big data, which is very important and is very accessible in um, 
high income areas. It is somewhat more accessible with mobile phone uh, applications. Some of this data is becoming more accessible um, in the field. But what's also important is the perception of the analysis of the key stakeholders and the community through interviews and observation. This information is often missing in official documents and can provide an understanding of the immediate needs. So there's a combination of getting the quantitative uh, observational and the uh, population-based disease data, but also the perception data. And the synthesis of both these diagnostic approaches allows you to understand what the collective health problem will be. So here's a problem tree of high child mor mortality in Cote d'Ivoire. And a problem tree is something that's often used in uh, public health planning and community health pro uh, program planning, because when the problem is dissected this way, we get an idea of where interventions can take place and how these interventions can deal with dealing with the ultimate morbidity or mortality issue. Um, here you can see there's deaths from malaria related to, at the very bottom, unmanaged stagnant water sources, which is outside of the realm of health, but in the realm of environment, which has an impact on health. And then the lack of mosquito nets, where a lot of interventions look at distributing insecticide treated mosquito nets to deal with prevention um, and dealing with high infection levels. Then we look at lack of investment in social sectors and how that has an impact on investment on infrastructure. We look at insufficient sanitation and how this links to impacts on uh, contaminated water sources and ultimately diarrhea, ultimately having an impact on childhood mortality. In all of these uh, um, uh, examples, interventions can be had by addressing these particular causes and ultimately impacting overall child mortality. And that is how we identify the collective problems when we begin to identify the type of intervention we would have. So this is a model and I'm not gonna go through the whole uh, planning process, but the diagnosis and identification of problems and then the interventions from the causes of these problems allows you to define the objectives and the general overall objective and specific objectives are extremely important when you talk about strategically intervening and identifying these objectives and specific objectives must be done with the key stakeholders, including your internal team and the external stakeholders that are very much part of the process and the community in which who are being targeted are extremely important stakeholders in this process. And ultimately setting up the program, tracking and monitoring with indicators and smart indicators and eventually evaluating the project is all part of the health project planning cycle that allows for an iterative process of implementing a very relevant and effective uh, program. So now the question is, you have diverging priorities and we see with the COVID situation, the lockdowns have created a lot of uh, collateral damage in an economic and social and um, mental health psychological perspective. And some of our interventions um, are, um, are, we need to take into consideration these uh, collateral impacts. But what you need to understand in public health is that we look at health from an overall perspective. We might think of a disease being microbes uh, impacting um, our bodies, uh, contaminating us, infecting us. But in fact, uh, health is uh, determined by many factors and many determinants. First of all, the age and sex and the constitutional or genetic factors that we have, but there's individual lifestyle factors, there's social and community networks, and then there's education, the work environment, water and sanitation, healthcare services, housing, all of these have an impact on health as well as the general socioeconomic environment. So when we are conceiving of a public health intervention, we're taking into consideration the determinants of health and how these determinants actually interact with one another to have an overall impact on morbidity and mortality and disability in a population. So how do you manage that? Well, political debate. We talked about that and, and others have talked about that, I think, uh, in the first introduction about where can we, in a, in a, in a political debate, argue uh, for allocation of resources towards different interventions? And where does education of 
the ones in the debate uh, play a role in understanding the different collateral, collateral impacts. And the multi-stakeholder involvement and negotiation is extremely important in that. In addition is the intersectoral collaboration, not just the health sector playing their role in public health, but other sectors as well. Housing, energy, um, water and sanitation, um, occupational health, all of these sectors play an important role in understanding what kinds of interventions. We talked about stagnant water sources uh, in, in increasing the um, presence of uh, malaria carrying mosquitoes. Well, in fact, the environment sector has a big role in changing uh, these kinds of stagnant pools to decrease infection rates in the population. And what's really important is constantly tracking and monitoring the social, economic, and psychological impacts of the interventions that we're doing and responding with support and programming. In, um, in the COVID situation, the psychological impacts of lockdown and social isolation and also domestic violence has been tracked. And there's more and more online support, for example, for um, um, sufferers of domestic violence and trying to get to those people who are isolated. So tracking is extremely important. The next question, how do you organize various tools at your disposal? Communication, oh sorry, communication versus direct intervention. So I'll go very quickly. We know there are biomedical tools like diagnostics, vaccines and therapeutics, but we know until these are widely available, we need to work on risk communication and community engagement. And this is extremely important and must be community centered. It must be informed by data, both qualitative and quantitative. Trust is extremely important and must be participatory. It must be open and transparent. It must be integrated. It must be accountable. And this is just an example of something that was developed uh, with uh, different stakeholders to deal with the coronavirus. And then the last question was, when you can't win definitively, how do you define the threshold under which you can live? So all different countries have had different strategies on dealing with this pandemic. And the strategies all are accepting a number, a, a level at which they accept uh, infection and disease. And um, in this, they've, surveillance has been extremely important. Exclusion strategy, for example, maximum action to exclude disease, the Pacific Islanders and territories, they've basically decided they don't want any disease. The elimination strategy in which just specific geographical areas are eliminating the disease have been accepted by China and Taiwan. The suppression strategy, actually increase in a stepwise and targeted manner to substantial lower the case numbers and outbreaks in Europe and North America. The mitigation strategy, which Sweden initially undertook was to flatten the peak. And then no substantive strategy was largely uncontrolled pandemic in some lower income countries. Those, these different strategies show a social acceptance of what is considered acceptable in disease and death. Um, and of course, these are evolving and changing. This is an example of, statistics, mm -hmm. of indicators that are used for governments to decide on the level or phase in which a country would go into. And I wanted to just show you some indicators that are quantitative that allow you to understand where these decision thresholds are made. So in the green prevent zone, this is from the Ministry of Ontario in Canada. Um, they, they looked at the weekly incidence rate is less than 10 per 100,000. The percent positivity of the tests are 0.5%. The reproduction number is less than one. And the level of community transmission and non-NEPI linked cases are stable. We say that the hospital intensive care unit capacity is adequate and the public health system capacity case and contact follow up within 24 hours is adequate. That is at the prevention level. I'm not going to go through all of them because I have little time, but just to show how things change in the red and control zone, you see that the hospital ICU capacity is risk of being overwhelmed and the public health system is at a risk of being overwhelmed as well. And then in a lockdown, we see that the adverse trends after entering the red control, such as increased weekly incidence and case incidence of test positivity, 
Increasing cases that are test positivity among people age 70 or over, increased outbreaks among vulnerable populations. The health system is over, overwhelmed and the public health capacity is overwhelmed and we go into lockdown. These types of indicators are extremely important. And this is my last slide to show you where is the threshold and where do we decide? When is it a win? When is it, isn't it a win? Without protective measures, we have more people ill in a short period of time and we don't have the health system to treat them. The threshold and with the measures that we have, we spread it out, but we can treat people. We have the capacity and that's how we decide whether things are going to be a win, uh, a decisive win or indecisive win. Thank you. Nita, Nita, thank you very much indeed. I, I was struck by how much commonality there was between healthcare and the language you were talking and the military one of, of grand strategy. Uh, you know, even in things like, you know, the, the diagnostic in the problem tree you were talking about, mapping the, the totality of the issue to understand where the intervention would have the most impact should in theory be being done in national security councils. I'm not sure exactly we see the science being applied in the same way that it is in, in healthcare, in that targeted interventions take place in healthcare, but I think there's much more broad use of the military, and perhaps that's something we want to get to in questions. But also when you discussed communication, I was suddenly struck by the idea that whilst you have a, 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 a a, a, a completely different language in healthcare, which most, you know, uh, the, the lay person would not understand more generally. The reality is, is that doctors and healthcare professionals tend to communicate with clients in the general population in a very clear and concise way, in a way that is both professional, but is also understandable. It's digestible while still retaining that essence of science. And I sometimes worry that the military is somehow missing this trick and is either disappearing down, becoming too technical, uh, or, or is making it up. Anyway, I thought you ended with probably the most important points that I want to get to with all our panelists at the end. Firstly, about thresholds. In essence, you know, we might dress it up, but it's about what level of death is acceptable. Uh, you know, I think is a really, really difficult question to answer. But also then I want to get from all panelists at the end of this, the idea about how do the people in these professions learn to live with the fact that this is a forever war? It's a forever campaign. It's going to outlast them through to retirement. And I think that's something I hope we can get into discussion right at the end. But in the meantime, let me hand over to Jean-Luc and uh, we'll come at it from a policing perspective. Uh, sir, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Peter, uh, for such a flattering and probably undeserved introduction, which puts some pressure on me, actually. But anyway, uh, well, first of all, let me thank you for giving me this opportunity to address such a brilliant audience. Let me also thank you for this opportunity to greet uh, General Vigilant, whom I first met when I was the commanding officer of the Gendarmerie Forces in Burgundy, while he was a Dijon Air Force Base Commander. I am Major General Retired Fadier, and I'm going, it's my pleasure, sorry, to share my experience with you. Before I start speaking about the topic of the day, I would like to warn you, however, about the fact that my wars may sound less thrilling than fighting against ISIS terrorists. But these were my wars. And this is what I'm going to share with you. Winning without victory. Well, the question may sound odd, but I think it is on purpose, of course. And it leads us to this double question. What does winning mean? What about victory. However, that question summarizes pretty well what I'm sure about that all of you have already experienced wherever, wherever you may come from. To begin with, uh, you have to keep in mind that dealing with homeland security issues, you have to cope with a kind of holistic adversity, either consisting in organized criminals or terrorists or in very ordinary events, which surprisingly and unpredictably may become extraordinary. The gendarmes who are listening to me now know, know that pretty well, sorry, if they are not mapping, of course. Uh, let us go deeper. Um, to help you better understand the context I had to live with, I need to share with you the overall picture of what I found, what I had to cope with, and why and how I did it. Now I have to apologize 
or I'm going to inflict you some figures and data which can sound a little time consuming and cumbersome, but they are necessary to understand my operational context. But I promise there will only be one slide. The provincial command of the gendarmerie forces in Burgundy, when I took over my responsibilities in 2011, was then and is still a middle sized one with a strength of more than 2,500 gendarmes and civil servants and almost 900 reservists. They are, and I had uh, roughly 250 units. Uh, my operating budget was less than 8 million euros at most, but after removing what I had to pay for gas and the heating of my barracks, for instance, I had no more than roughly 3 million euros left. The province of Burgundy consisted then in four departments, Côte d'Or, Yonne, saône et loire and Yen. My command extended over a rather vast territory, almost 32,000 square kilometers. 6% of the French territory. And I was in charge of supervising security missions carried out for more than two thirds of the population of the province, almost 1.2 million inhabitants out of a total of 1.6. In my area of responsibility, I had more than 2,000 towns and villages, some of them quite tiny. My units registered around 50% of the crimes perpetrated in the province, and population density is quite low, 52 inhabitants per square kilometer, whereas the national rate would rather be around 113. Interestingly, the population in three of my departments, Yev, Yon, and Sonilois, was getting older, which meant that more, more people died there than there were birds. It's an important point, which I'm making. The crime rate, around 30,000 crimes a year in my area of responsibility, which is rather low if you compare with other areas in France, ranked 13, considering the national figure for the whole gendarme. However, the province is crossed by numerous highways and was at the crossroads of two major crime clusters the areas around Paris and Lyon. When I took over my functions, break and enter burglaries were a genuine plague, with an increase which, in some areas, reached 20%. Perpetrated by organized criminals coming from Eastern Europe, this type of crime was my top priority. To sum up briefly, you have to keep in mind that the operational pressure if you only consider the crime rate, was not so high. But the population living in my area of responsibility was generally very scattered, and I told you, rather middle-aged or old. That means that this type of population, sorry, is more vulnerable to the feeling of being insecure. And in some places, things were growing psychotic and irrational because perverts could actually occur anywhere. Honestly, I must confess that in theory, my human resources were sufficient, globally speaking, but I was pretty much unsatisfied with the way they were distributed. Moreover, due to the overall review of public policies, my budget was only sufficient to operate on a routine basis. I remember that one month, we almost ran short out of gas. Before my arrival, and again for budget reasons, dealt with on a on nationwide scale, my command almost, my command, sorry, lost almost 140 gendarmes, the equivalent of one of my big divisional companies, or in other words, more than 5% of my total strength. But like all my comrades, I had to do with that. So at this stage, keep in mind that what I've just told you, a middle-sized regional command, in many places a scattered, rather old and low-class population, often living with the feeling 
but the government is deserting them. In addition, a wave of, a wave of break and an enter child crime, sorry, strengthening that negative feeling, which had to be tackled with a scattered territorial distribution of my units, some of them very small, by the way. And I'm trying to share something. Uh, okay. I hope you see it. Can you see it? Okay. Just to show you an example, uh, it's uh, the distribu territorial distribution of, of my units in one of my departments, so many one. Okay. So, having said that, let us get, get back to today's topic. Is it possible to win without victory? Well, uh, I would say that considering that unless you live in North Korea, the zero crime rate is impossible to achieve. You just have to adapt to the situation and consequently you had no other choice but to maneuver so as to keep threats under the threshold and I would add to the more accurate an acceptable threshold. The Gendarmerie General Directorate urged the provincial commanders to foster the creation of small and non-permanent investigating units to deal with our East European criminals. But this man, this man, sorry, the function of manpower on my basic territorial small units, which was not a very popular idea among my troops, but we had no other option. I concluded that I could not assure win a crushing victory. But at that, I would win anyway. On the one hand, if I kept my subordinates' confidence, and on the other hand, by convincing the mayors and population in my area of responsibility, that they would see more gendarmes patrolling outside than never before. And by the way, what they pay taxes for. This was the opportunity to teach my unit commanders an important lesson that myself, I learned some years ago. As the famous French writer André Gide put it, choisir c'est renoncer. Making choices means that you have to give up other options. Therefore, I told them that one, one choice is made, is made, sorry, you have to stick on it, which doesn't mean that you don't have to adjust your options during the action. What I'm telling you may sound so basic, so obvious that you could think that I'm considering you as an experienced young recruit. But believe me, at least in the gendarmerie, this was not so obvious. I remember old NCO really frustrated and quite uncomfortable about the fact that there were things and tasks that had to be dropped or at least postponed. And let us admit that we in the military are not used to that. I told you that I had no choice but to implement what my general directorate ordered me to do as far as our break and her crime, the break and enter crimes problem was concerned. But it was my choice to focus and make focus on a small number of priorities. Then I remembered some lectures which I attended at the War College. Concentration of effort freedom of action, and economy of means. Well, I already had the third item, the economy of means. I achieved the first one, and I just told you. As for the second one, I decided to adapt the territorial distribution of my units in order to give them a larger capacity to maneuver and cover their territory. Over my four years being in charge of my command, I could piece down for 15, 15 small units while redeploying the equivalent strength where I considered it was necessary and useful. Of course, some males were, were, were very unhappy with that, but one of them very honestly told me that perhaps he lost a gendarmerie station, but at the same time, he could however see more often gendarmerie patrols in his town and over the area. I said to myself that I was going to win my bet. But what I needed was a bigger and better connection between the gendarmerie and the population. We were asked by our general directory to develop a neighborhood watch program, but there was some resistance and reluctancy among some males, 
who considered that it was our job and not theirs to deter crime and that their population was not ready to report suspicious behaviors to the gendarmerie. Then came the terrorist attacks of 2014. Because my gendarmes were more used to going outside, leaving red tape behind them, they knew much better their area of responsibility where the population was more used to seeing them, either on board their patrol vehicles or on their bicycles, or even patrolling on foot, or of course, on traffic control operations. The weeks after the attacks, we held the ground like never before, just because we were asked to deter another possible terrorist attack. But we also succeeded in securing and strengthening the confidence of the population. Believe me or not, but immediately after, we signed a huge number of neighborhood watch agreements with towns which so far had been rather reluctant. Almost at the same time, the burglary problem was under control, stabilized in some points, decreasing in many others with better crime solving rates. When I handed over my command, break and enter crimes and burglaries were reduced by more than 5%, I believe. So, as a conclusion, I would like to remind you what, of what Marshal Job once said. I do not know who won the Battle of the Mound, but I know who would have lost it. I'm not trying to depict myself as a history maker, of course. I'm just telling you that it is, of course, possible to win without victory, provided that you make your own choices, knowing why you make them taking responsibility for them and being able to explain your subordinates the reasons you order them to act accordingly. There is no small win because there are no meaningless battles. Well, here we are, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you for your attention. Jean-Luc, a beautiful story, beautifully told, uh, really nice. I look forward to coming back to it. I'm struck again by this idea of perception, which I think came out of Nita's, about the need to relate to your audience. We call them stakeholders or you know, your target audience. But the, the relationships that you hold around you, which are really important. And indeed, you know, the idea of making these choices. I mean, you yourself went back to the principles of war, would have been familiar to perhaps not Germany, but certainly to Foch's ones, even perhaps to Savkin. You know, there, there's a relationship here with how we make choices that's really important. And maybe this is something we'll get to with Sarah. So the world of business, Sarah, um, you know, this this again is a, a, a very indecisive, unending set of competitions. The floor is yours. We look forward to your intervention. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Uh, and uh, thank you for having me. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Um, I, I wanted to, obviously, it's going to be a whiz tour. Uh, we could spend hours talking about uh, the indecisive or ambiguous environment uh, in how business is tackling it. But I would like to share some key thoughts around uh, the, my decision support experience on how the business will consider indecisiveness in a planning context and also why living with indecisive environments in the business world is such a vital challenge to tackle uh, and how they tackle it. And I will finish, uh, Peter, uh, I hope I can add my two cents on four key opportunities, actually, trying to flip the coin. Uh, we are talking a lot about challenges, but there might be key opportunities uh, to change and business, how would business contribute to that working with the public sector as well. And again, happy to take some, some questions at the end. But before I start, there, there is a key observation on how the business world considers the word indecisiveness or indecisive environments in a planning context. Obviously, from a military standpoint, it's quite clear and, and everybody has talked about it. But for businesses, obviously, it's, it doesn't mean a comprehensive, so never able to have a comprehensive win. Be, meaning indecisive, not decisive. Uh, but from a business point of view, it's more from the decision-making outcome perspective. So meaning more dealing with ambiguity, ambiguous environment. So I will, I will stay in that particular, uh, particular field. Um, so in my 20 years experience, um, I have really seen that the words also ambiguity, how businesses tackle ambiguity is really considered as another planning assumption. 
So ambiguity has to be then managed accordingly. So you are having a third category that will be embedded in decision support planning. So the best case scenario, the worst case scenario, and the ambiguous case or cases, should I say. And in a color analogy, obviously, white cases, black cases, and, and gray cases. So how do businesses tackle and plan for those gray cases? We're going to come back to that in a second. But first, a few words, obviously, the business uh, world context is a bit different from the military one. And they have, by nature, a more shorter, immediate outlook, I would say. So they consider the short, medium term. And I will come back. There is something to be done around for them to become better at considering the longer term and how to manage that. They have also a challenging, competitive, and complex environment. So they are really, really used to look at all the ecosystem, all the stakeholders. So obviously, the obvious one, competitors, but customers, their clients, regulators, governments, media, etc. There is also, from a business perspective, the need to adapt fast. So this is a fast moving world, uh, world. So obviously, to be able to thrive, but at times also to be able to survive as an organization itself, which is often has obviously high stakes there too, from that angle. And the ambiguity within business is also has a measurable cost. So the impact, obviously, of that, they are keen to avoid and get clarity on how to tackle it. So how do business go about it? So typically what I have seen, so to tackle ambiguous environments, so gray cases. So I have seen they, have, they can apply two-dimensional planning approaches for decision support or, and they should do a bit more, of three-dimensional approaches. So I'm not going to go into, into the deep dive uh, because it would be great to take some questions, but for two dimensional. So, for example, the classic risks and impact assessments, contingency, mitigation, action planning, communication planning at all levels. So the kind of uh, uh, bronze, uh, um, silver and gold kind of trust, classical resilience planning. But there is also a physical security planning, but also the virtual environment is more and more tackled as well. So, for example, social media is being monitored quite actively, live actioning tools as well to be able to answer to their customers very quickly, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So they are trying to get always one step ahead, even if obviously in social media context, this is proving impossible. Um, but there is also the classic, and we have talked about this scenario planning, foresight tools that are absolutely fantastic to understand, to understand especially the longer term impacts. And then there is also the traditional learning and training to learn new skills, and business does that also very well around leadership, business continuity, et cetera, so all kinds of topics. But I have seen more and more, especially for gray cases, those two dimensional planning approaches in business tend not to work as well because obviously the environment being is quite fluid so you need to have a multiple uh, scenario uh, approach and how do you go about that how do you understand the impacts of you know your decisions or your actions on the wider ecosystem so there is a strong need here to, one, look at it more holistically and apply a real system thinking approach here. What I mean by that is you can see you are able to zoom in into trees, but you can also see the forest. So you are able to see the detail for, for a business, for example, around what are the impacts for me or from a market share perspective, how would competitors you know, react to this particular drug launch, et cetera. But you are also able to zoom out and really see holistically what are those interdependencies between the different actors and stakeholders. What does that mean? Does actually my planning work in that case? And if so, what do I need to do differently? And second point that uh, is quite powerful in that is they, they need to do more a kind of immersive experiential event, obviously taking it from the military war games. So around business war gaming has been seen as quite a useful tool to understand the tree or the trees, but also to understand the forest and the wider ecosystem. Because it is, again, a safe environment to try and fail. And that the consequences of trying, like in the military, and there is strong links here, 
is is really having that that uh, safe environment to to be able to see what are the consequences of your decisions. How do everybody react? What are the red teams? You know, the competitors, the regulator. What do they do? What does it mean for us? So you can try different things. And for gray cases, it's particularly relevant because you don't have just one gray case, you have a multiple of them. And having that embedded in your kind of planning resilience muscle memory is something that businesses are starting to, but not doing enough, like they often do in the public sector or are more used to uh, for obvious reasons. And, and the third point I would make here also is really around how to apply more the perfect storm scenario and also what we uh, have mentioned, the gray rhinos earlier by Peter, but there is also this all, all kinds of black. So black swans, black elephants, and I heard recently black jellyfish for COVID. So it, it's really around all those black and gray scenarios. How do you plan for it? How do you actually spot those blind spots and really have this kind of longer term view and practice when they potentially also all come together at the same time? So the perfect storm scenario. One example, obviously, and I won't, won't bash um, the UK being half French, half German, but there is, and I, I deal with it a lot currently, is around what about the consequences of Brexit with COVID and where we are at currently, and maybe additionally for a business, an internal transformation of some sort. What if all those things together, you know, can create quite, quite havoc uh, in, in the business world? But Peter, conscious of time as well, four final points for me and also four key opportunities i think on how to better tackle uh, ambiguous environment and contribute uh, to change one is planning for those gray cases systematically there, there is no question and i think COVID has highlighted that very well that there is a need in the business world to do more medium to longer term horizon scanning and more regularly and really push the boundary on actually is that really what we mean? Can, does, what, what, what is it? If we are having all those things coming together, how can we survive effectively? Um, but also obviously linking the two-dimensional and three-dimensional planning method I just mentioned and embedding those in the decision support DNA of how they had to go about their resilience, their testing, and that it's a continuous improvement loop is quite important because it's all good to do one of those events but if you don't implement it and be part of the planning process as such it's it's meaningless um, and also another point here around the gray cases is around looking at external challenges yes they are looking at it constantly and they are very well versed with it but what about internal as well and often this is quite this is quite an overlooked angle and not only the classical uh, maybe disgruntled employee, but there are other things that could have, however minor, it's combining all those little things together that can create those blind spots that you didn't foresee or didn't expect. The second point, and I think this is paramount, it's the public and private sectors need absolutely to collaborate more. There is, and I think COVID has been uh, at, at times a fantastic example of what worked well on certain things but it needs to become part and be a regular thing uh, where they need to understand each other much more and exchange best practices because actually we are all in it together uh, however there are different you know aims and objectives it's it's we are we are dealing we are living in this particular world and we need to work uh, collaboratively uh, to really tackle especially in those ambiguous environments and ambiguous times. Um, but also there is a need to do more collaboration of front of mind challenges. So for example, it happened to me, uh, so there is a lot around market wide exercises, especially in the financial sector. They're absolutely brilliant at it. And they are bringing all you know, the sector, public and private as well together and really look at you know, from cyber attacks uh, to, to regulatory challenges on how you know, if there was a survival question, how would they go about it? So why not do more of those across all sectors to really see on front of mind topics, obviously COVID, but also geopolitical challenges, sustainability, innovation, you name it. Um, so that would be quite an interesting one. So collaboration is the second point. Peter, two more points. So one is focusing, really, really important one is focusing on the business decision makers. Because obviously compared to the army, the military, 
there is a classic way of you are trained to be a leader and you are trained to take decisions. In business, it's completely different. Um, you, you, are, you are dealing with a business person that is there for different reasons. I'm not saying I haven't met good leaders, but there is also a challenge that when you are in a stressful and ambiguous environment, it requires to rehearse a particular set of leadership skills and response teams coming together. It, it really creates this need that they need to really train as an individual as a leader of those individuals, but as a team of leaders as well. So having a look at from those different angles uh, is particularly paramount. And the last point uh, is really as well that has been pushed with COVID, but for me is a big opportunity around having focusing on purpose. Businesses are more and more purpose driven uh, and they're really, really uh, taking a look at how to they contribute to the employees to the customers, but to society as a whole as well. And COVID has highlighted that shift even further and accelerated that quite, quite a lot. So the why of businesses is changing and they have, I think, a really big role to play in tandem with the public sector to actually lift this indecisive, ambiguous environment fog. It, so uh, um, I would say the indecisive, the ambiguous environment is allergic to collaboration is allergic to actually purpose. If there is a way to tackle this, that's where I would start. Uh, and, and business have a great opportunity to be a catalyst for change in that, working hand in hand, again, with the public sector. So they could not only become better at navigating indecisive slash ambiguous environments with what we said above, but in tandem, bring their purpose-driven actions to contribute to build a less indecisive world. And that's my thought, Peter. Very happy to take any questions and contribute further. Sarah, that was a, a brilliant intervention. Thank you very much indeed. And, and the questions are flowing in. We've got them across here in the, in the side panel and, and, and we'll get them. We're not going to get them face to face because of the challenges of time management and people need to get a break for the next session. But we will get to those and, and post some answers so we can get through them. But I'm struck by all three of you in this idea of, of the threshold of, of how to have the conversation, whether it's with business leaders or with mayors or with politicians about the thresholds at which you know, behaviors are acceptable, our behaviors must change. But also the, the points that Sarah brought out there about this very popular military ideas at the moment of pace, of speed, of scale, you know, this narrative that we continue to hear uh, from you know, futurologists and, and fiction writers, that the world is changing faster than ever before. But I think all three of you took a step back, a sort of measured pace. And whilst there was a degree of you know, repetition and use of the military lessons. They weren't the military lessons of the last five years. They were the military lessons across millennia of experience rather than just the past five years. And I think there's a sort of, I would relate it as a Colin Gray school perhaps, which is that actually we've been dealing with a similar situation with similar challenges, uh, whether it's, you know, smallpox or burglary or, uh, or, or new fishmongers perhaps, you know, in different ways in business uh, for hundreds of years. And perhaps we shouldn't just knee jerk to some of these things that we think are the most important ever. Now, I think there are, raises very important questions from everything we've talked. I mean, in this panel, we've admired the problem. We've characterized it. We've compared it. We've contrasted it. We've drawn out some beautiful examples. But reacting to it is really the job of the next panel. And I am really excited, genuinely excited uh, to, to hear from our next three speakers. We've got Bill McRaven, Ike Wilson and Eugene Keegan, who are going to bring us some of those solutions. But in their meantime, Benjamin, I would uh, offer a round of applause to our three speakers from me. But it's back to you.